Hey, hey, what you wonder is how you loving, how you loving, how you loving. We're live and today we are tackling a really prickly question. Is Yahweh slash Jehovah slash YHWH, is that God? Is that the God of the universe? It's prickly. It's prickly. It will hurt feelings. It is a touchy subject. I realize that it's a touchy, touchy subject because I'm from Christianity. I was raised up in fundamentalist Christianity, yet we've got to have a conversation about it. And the conversation has got to be based on truth and facts, not what we have been taught to believe, not what we hold dear that has no evidence, not what we've been told. That's where we are with Christian witches. We've got to find out. We've got to get to the bottom of things. We've got to find out the truth. So let's begin. Deep breath. And just let everything that you've been taught float out of your head just for these next few minutes as we have this conversation. Just let everything that you've been taught float out of the top of your head. That's all. You can suspend it there. Maybe after this conversation, you can grab it and think it again if you want to. Slight for now, we're just making space in our mind for truth. God, we give thanks. We give thanks for the grace that is here for us to come into the truth of who we are, the truth of universal source and to let go of that which is not true. Easily and divinely, we simply let it go. Amen. So, I'm ready. So this conversation is going to be about Yahweh, and I've got lots of goodies for you. Hey! Daniel, how you loving, how you loving, how you loving? I got lots of goodies for you. I have proof for you. I have a presentation for you. I have references for you at the end. So stay all the way to the end and we have plenty of references. Now, I do want to preface this by saying I'm going to treat this conversation with care and love and compassion because I do understand that some of the things that I'm about to say are very upsetting. They are very upsetting because they go contrary to what we've been taught. They are absolutely not what's been drilled into our heads by the church for millennia. At this point, over 2000 years, maybe even 2,500 or so years, People have believed the things that we're going to talk about tonight that just are not so. So let's begin. Is Yahweh God? We're going to go on screen share. And I want to hear your comments as we go through this about how's this landing on you? What thoughts are coming up? Now, I want to share with you who this conversation is not for. This conversation is not for Christians who have a thin skin, right? You're a Christian, you have a thin skin, you can't um, deal with anyone that says anything other than what you believe. <clears throat> Pardon me. You are completely closed to finding out anything other than what you believe. This conversation is not for you. So before y'all light up the comments, this conversation is not for you. This conversation is also not for anyone who wants to stay believing what they have always believed. If that's you, God bless you. No, nothing wrong with that. Believe what you've always believed. Go on your merry way. Be peaceful because this is a conversation that stirs up things within the being. So if you want to believe what you've always believed, this conversation is not going to be for you because... I have been in a tremendous upheaval and deconstruction of probably by this time, at this point, hundreds, if not thousands of beliefs. I formerly would have, quote unquote, you know, sworn on a stack of Bibles, which is true. They're gone now. 
That was not an easy process. So I have compassion. That was not an easy process. It still continues to not be an easy process. It's like peeling back, peeling back, peeling back. It's like, what? That's not true either. What is true? What do we hold on to? And sometimes people go into nihilism. And sometimes people go into atheism. I never went into atheism because I know that there's a supreme source because I've had too many experiences with supreme source. Supreme source is just not what we were taught. So welcome. Who am I? I'm Reverend Valerie Love. I'm the author of 25 books on practical spirituality, the occult, magic, and Christian witchcraft. I am a seeker of truth. I am a teacher of the occult. I have a mystery school, and I am here to support anyone who wants to be free. What is Christian witches? Very important for us to get that out the way too, because people are like, Christian witch? You can't be a Christian witch. Christian witch, that's an oxymoron. Christian witch, no such thing. And in my mind, all Christians are witches and pagans because the entire religion is based on paganism. From every holiday to all of their beliefs, all of it is pagan. Not one bit of it isn't pagan. I'll prove that to you in another conversation. So to me, all Christians are Christian witches. They just don't know it. Changed my mind. Uh, we use the term around here, Christian, to mean what? A person who follows a religion? No. For me, being a Christian is a spiritual path of ascension to Christ consciousness. That's what Christian is for me. Now, you get to decide what the word Christian means for you. And for all of the beautiful members of the Christian witches community all over the world, you know what Christian means for you. And it probably doesn't mean the same thing that it means to people who are hardcore religious zealots. I'm not a religious zealot, even though I used to be. I used to be a religious zealot, so I can't I can't be mad at religious zealots. I do want to let you know that if you want to know more about how to be a Christian witch, this is the book to get, written by yours truly. Sounds like hotcakes, hundreds of reviews. Please do, if you've read it, please do leave a kind review because there are a lot of Christians, some of the most hateful people on the planet, even though their religion they tell us is about love, but they're, some of them, and I'll show you why they're so hateful. Uh, some of them have been the most hateful people in my entire life, hardcore Christians. They've been some of the most hateful people ever. They will damn you to hell. They'll tell you, you're, they'll get angry with you. They will tell you that you are uh, the dust of the earth. Yeah, you're going to hell. You're, 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 just, you're the demon. You're, you're, you're possessed by demons. The devil's got you. You're a false prophet. Stop misleading people. I hear all of that from what? Christians who supposedly are in a religion about love. I haven't seen the love, but that's what they tell us. Yeah, my, it's all about love, unconditional love, the love of God, the love of Jesus. But you're going to hell if you don't think the way I think. Well, that's loving. Yikes. Now, I'm not talking about all the wonderful Christians around the world who are truly living love. I'm not talking about those because those are wonderful. I'm talking about the disturbed ones. So we have to make a terminology distinction here that a Christian witch means a person who ascends or ascribes or aspires to Christ's consciousness based on a relationship with the Christ mind. That's beyond a person. I don't care if Jesus was a historical figure or not. That has nothing to do with me and Christ consciousness because Christ consciousness is not about a human. I don't think people, some people that get that on the way home because they think Christ consciousness and being a Christian is about a man that walked on this planet 2000 years ago and the Romans strung him up. Now, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this? What's the goal? What's the intention? Why am I even having this conversation? And why will I keep having these conversations with the global Christian witches community? Because the global Christian witches community is cutting edge and we are about something. We are about the great work and ascension to your God self. We study the magical arts and sciences as well as the mystical arts, including esoteric and occult teachings. We are about ancient, we study ancient civilizations, mystery schools, astrology, tarot, Bible magic, all the other wisdom teachings. For what? Just to be smart and have our head filled with a lot of information? No, to attain 
gnosis. What is gnosis? The Gnostics talked about it. It was an inner knowing. It wasn't knowledge. It's divine knowing without quite knowing how you know it because you know it came from a divine source. <clears throat> so if you would like that, we've got plenty for you at ChristianWitches.com. And of course, here is another one of my books in the Christian Witches series, the Christian Witchcraft Starter Kit. Pick it up, Spellcrafting for the Christian Witch. Christian Witch got tons of reviews. People love it. Okay. Let's get down to the business at hand. Is Yahweh, a.k.a. Jehovah, a.k.a. Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton, we'll talk about that. what that means in a moment, God of the universe? Is this the almighty God? Is this God, Yahweh, Jehovah, is this the almighty? Now I'm going to give you the short answer in one word. No. I'll now give you the long answer of how I came to that conclusion. Because many people say, ah, blasphemy, blasphemy. <laughs> or, like the Christian witches community, we'll simply study, we'll research, we'll use critical thinking skills, we'll read books, we'll watch Bible scholars, we'll watch historians on YouTube, we will go to workshops and events that further our knowledge in the ancient mysteries, the ancient world, and how it relates to today. Now that's what the Christian witches community is about. Other people who haven't quite gotten it yet, you know, maybe they're doing something else. I'm not, I'm not judge of what anyone does, nor am I the boss of what anyone does. I'm not even the boss of what I do. Spirit guides me. And the spirit that I'm talking about is not Jehovah. Now let me tell you how really how close to home this cuts. Let me come off screen share for a minute to tell you this. And then we're going to go back into our presentation. Let me come off screen share for just a minute to tell you about this. Hold on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're a jealous, angry guy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let me come off screen share to tell you about this for a second. I grew up one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Get that. The name was in the name of the religion, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, no one knows if the divine name that they call Jehovah, they call it a divine name, if that is truly the pronunciation of the word, because Hebrew doesn't have alpha, that doesn't have um, vowels. So the way it was written in Hebrew was Y-H-W-H, yod vey ha vey Hope I'm saying that right. I don't speak Hebrew, nor do I read Hebrew. Y-H-W-H, almost everybody knows the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, right? That's what they told us. So they don't even know that it's pronounced Jehovah or Yahweh, somewhere in there. We only know that it was Y-H-W-H, no vowels. And for many years, Jewish people did not pronounce the word because it was considered too holy to pronounce. So people didn't even say it. So the pronunciation over time was lost. I grew up in a cult. It's the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're still going. I think they're shrinking now because I think the gig is up with the internet. People can do researches right at your fingertips. You can find out all the things that these religions have been saying. It's the God's honest truth, and it simply is not. Well, you can imagine my shock and horror when I found out quite a bit ago that Jehovah was not Almighty God, because that's what I was taught. I don't know what you were taught. Were you taught that Yahweh was God or Jehovah or Yah or Jah, that this is the Most High? That's his name. Many of us were taught that the yod Hey vav Hey. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Danielle, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, Atlanta. Hey, Crystal in Atlanta. Hey, Darla. How you loving? How you loving? So we were taught in church, probably, if you are Christian or Jewish, you were probably taught or brought up into some kind of belief that there was one God, his name is Jehovah or Yahweh or YHWH, too holy to pronounce. He lives in the heavens. He's a jealous God and he fulfills all of the uh, antics. He's up to all the antics that we read about in the Old Testament. Now, I used to wonder a lot about this God. I used to wonder why in the world is this God so angry? Why does this God kill his own kids? God made us? Yes. 
And then God gave us a choice on what to do? Yes. But if we don't pick what he said, he kills us? No, even worse. For Jehovah's Witnesses, it was complete obliteration because Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in a burning hell, which they're right about that because they know hell was invented because they looked it up. In other religions, they tell you that you are going to burn forever and ever in a burning hell and a never ending torment just because you don't even believe in this God. OK, let's go a little further with this. This God killed people. Yes. And in the Bible, it has this God say, kill the women, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children. That's that's God. That's where we came from. Yes. That's our creator? Yes. The God is love. Oh, these people, nah. Nah, you can't get me with that one. You can't get me with kill the women, kill the children, kill, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children. And God is love. How do you reconcile those two without asking some very deep, hard, penetrating questions that no one in church wants you to ask? They don't want you to ask those questions. Because they certainly don't have the answer for them, and they're just going to call you some kind of heretic. What does heretic mean? Actually, heretic actually means person who thinks for themselves. So I guess all of us as Christian witches, we're all heretics. Or in this community, we're a community of free thinkers. Nobody tells you what to think in this community. You think what you want to think. You've come to the conclusion yourself. You must have some good reason why you came to those conclusions. And hopefully it's helpful for you and for other people. When I was a kid... I wondered if he is the only God, what does he have to be jealous of? Boom. Isn't that a good question? Here's another question. Why in the Bible does it say? It doesn't say in the Bible that there's no other gods. It says it in the Bible. The Bible's full of gods. It said, have no other gods before me. Like there's plenty of other gods, but I'm the, I'm the one. That's for you. You can't have no other gods in front of me. That sounds like an egomaniacal. I don't know what to say about that. It sounds very egomaniacal. Let's go back to our presentation, shall we? OK, we're going to go on screen share because we're putting this God on trial. If you're the God of the universe, you're not doing a very good job as far as I'm concerned. I said it. Let's go further into our presentation, OK? So now we understand that we have been presented with a particular kind of God. He kills people. He's very angry. He's very jealous. But yet they tell you God is love. When you read the Bible, which I love reading, it appears that there are two gods. It appears that the God of the Old Testament is me, angry, war, Fire, sulfur, famine, pestilence. And it seems like the God that Yeshua came to tell us about is love. It's really two gods in the Bible. Okay, let's go further. Before we can really get to the understanding of is Yahweh God, is Jehovah God, we have to understand what is the Bible. Now, the Bible, because that's where we got this God, right? They told us about this. This is where we first heard about the God. We heard about this God from the Bible. Now, in the last 200 years, science, history, archaeology has unearthed more information about the past in the past 200 years and probably the last couple of thousand years. And now we are getting to see that the Bible is not history. The Bible is believed to be the inerrant word of God. That's what is believed. Recently, with history and archaeology, this has proven not to be so. References will be provided at the end. Don't worry, stay with me. It is believed to be historically accurate until recent discoveries in the past two centuries. The Bible is nowhere near historically accurate. It is believed to be literal, that the things that you read in the Bible, you're supposed to take them literally. That's scary because the Bible is scary as hell. The Bible, here's what I have come to understand about the Bible. And you've got to come to your own understanding about the Bible, whatever it is. I'm not telling you what to believe about the Bible. I'm telling you what conclusions I came to about the Bible. This is what I came to about the Bible. The Bible is a library, and the Lord's a collection. 
of writings by many people across many centuries and many locations, all of whom had reasons to write what they wrote and most often it was to advance an agenda. That's what the Bible is, I'm gonna say it again. The Bible is a library, it's a collection of writings by many people, not one tiny group of people, many people across many centuries, so centuries to actually write the Bible, and in many locations, all of whom, if a person sat down and sat down and put pen to paper or ink to a scroll, they had a reason for doing so, and most often it was to advance an agenda. That's kind of hard to believe right there that this holy book that we love so much is it filled with agendas. This is all proven. I am not making any of this up. Now, I'll tell you what the Bible is for me because I myself love the Bible. I think it's one of the best spell books going. I think it's got amazing things in it. This is what the Bible is for me. The Bible contains astrology, metaphor, allegory, myth, legend, let me fix that. Legend, uh oh, legend, gods and goddesses, miracles, magic, mysticism, and more. It's a highly useful book, though not the word of God. It's very useful. To me, the Bible is very useful. Let me correct my error right there. Legends, okay? To me, the Bible is extremely useful. I find the Bible to be absolutely useful for many things good stories. Amazing allegories, wow, powerful warnings, uh, myth, legend. I love that the Bible contains Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Akkadian lore and legend hidden if you know what you're looking for. Oh, the Bible is amazing. It's just not what we were told. Now, how to understand what we are talking about. How can you understand the Bible? Because I want to understand the Bible. I want to understand where did Christianity come from? Where did Judaism come from? Where did all the things we believe come from? I had to find out. And on this years long journey that I have been taking and finding all of these things, I've been shocked, sometimes horrified, sometimes dismayed, sometimes just, ugh, no more. It's been a pulling back of the veil to understand these things. And what do we have to understand? We have to understand geography. Where did these things happen? We have to understand politics, governments, and dynasties. If we don't understand that, we will not. there's no way we could ever hope to understand the Bible or where did this God come from that everybody thinks is the God of the universe and is not. We have to understand natural events, like when that huge uh, eruption occurred over in Santorini. Now I was in Sant I was at Santorini. I came up to Santorini when I was in the Greek islands. I was in the Greek islands a couple of times, and once I was in the Greek islands, we rode a ship from Paros down to Crete, and we stopped. One of the stops was at Santorini, and it's got this big, huge cliff. It's it's amazing. Santorini is so beautiful. And when we pulled up to Santorini, not pulled up when the boat, when the ship, cruise ship approaches Santorini, it's very striking. It's a very striking place. Well, Santorini has got a huge crater in the middle of it because there was a huge eruption there. The eruption was so huge that it blacked out the sun for a while. You know, with ash and everything, it affected the crops. And that was a huge impact of devastation in the ancient world. So we have to understand natural events. We have to understand the origins of our species. See people like the Anunnaki channel and Billy Carson for that. They will tell you all about the origin of our species. It's well documented. We must understand history. Family, if we don't read history, we will think that the Bible is correct because the Bible was the only thing we knew. Then we started to find out things. We kept pulling things out of the ground that said Yahweh and his Asherah. What? With archaeology, Yahweh and his Asherah. Yahweh had a wife. Yes, Yahweh had a wife. I'll prove it to you. Belief systems in the ancient world. We have to understand what did people in the ancient world believe? They thought differently from us today, didn't they? 
They didn't think the way we think. They thought differently. And in some ways, they thought exactly the way we think because the human element is still there. So these are the things that we must use to dig into the facts and find truth. Now, what are the origins of Yahweh? Yahweh is an ancient god of the Levant. What is the Levant? This is the Levant. Where is this? Remember we said geography? This is Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, as we know, Palestine. They're still having issues over there to this very day. And Cyprus, as you can see over here. The Levant is right over here to the west, to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Egypt down here, okay? Which is on the continent of Africa, obviously, right? And here's Turkey and up here, here's Iran and Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia. And then if you go straight over, then you're gonna head to, of course, China, Russia, and on. This is the Levant. Now, would you say that this is a large part of the world or a small part of the world? This is a tiny little segment of the whole world. This is where this God came from. This God originated in the Levant. Now, what nations were in the Levant at the time? We're talking thousands of years ago. We're talking hundreds of years BCE. Okay, centuries BCE. We're talking way back. We're going back, 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 back. 3,000 or so years ago. We don't know exactly when this God was created. You know, where did this God first came from? That's very difficult to pinpoint. Yet we can follow the historical and the archaeological records. And what we find is that this God was first associated with Seir, Edom, Paran, and Timon, and later with Canaan. Canaan, does that sound familiar? Well, of course it does, because every good Christian knows the Israelites versus the Canaanites was the Super Bowl of the ancient world. On one side, it was the it was the the showdown. You always had the Israelites and the Canaanites, but no one told you that the Israelites came from the Canaanites. The earliest Israelites were Canaanites. Mm. Like I said, I didn't make it up. We can study and find this out. I'll give you references in a few. Okay, so we understand that this God was a god of this area, the Levant. This god was associated with the Canaanites. This god, in addition to war, this god was also associated with storms. So think Shango. So if you are in the ATR's African traditional religions, we have a lot of gods too. I'm not, I don't practice African traditional religion. I'm saying we as in people of the African diaspora of which I am a part of the African diaspora. Well, in the African diaspora, we have many gods and all of the religions from Yoruba to Santeria, 21 divisions, Candomblé, all these different religions that came as rooted in and Voodoo, Vodou, rooted in Yoruba from Nigeria, Voodoo from Benin and Togo. And when these people were drawn, and in Ghana, you have the, um, the Akan peoples. When these people were drawn from their homes, they did not leave their religions behind because their gods live inside of them. These are divine forces, Shango, Oya, Oshun, Yemaya. These are divine forces. They traveled with the people through the Caribbean into part of those people went into New Orleans. You have a version of New Orleans voodoo there, different than what you have in Haiti. And then they went into the Americas. And then it congealed with German people and European people and Native American people. And when you put an African person with a Native, Native American person with a German person, what do you get? Hoodoo. That's what you get. 
Why? Because that's what we do when we meet up. We syncretize. We harmonize. We talk about religion. We intermarry. We find out what other people are doing. If it works better than what we're doing, hey, we'll adopt it. Humans have always done this from the beginning of time. Forever and ever. We have always come together, looked at what each other had. If something that somebody else had worked better than what you had, you adopted it or you weaved it in with your gods. Here is the beauty of paganism. Let me come off of this screen for a second. Let me, let me share something with you about paganism because many people don't know what we're, you know, why this is so important. Let me share with you something about uh, <laughs> paganism. Is there a fourth book? I can only find three on Amazon. Oh, yes, there was a fourth one. The fourth one is no longer in print. The fourth one is this one right here called Christian Witches Manifesto. This was actually the first one in the series. Then, no, no, no. Yeah, this I think was the first one in the series, was it? Or it could have been the second one. This one, How to Be a Christian Witch. And, and this one, Magical Prayers for the Christian Witch, and this one, Spellcrafting for the Christian Witch, which is really a compendium of magic for the Christian Witch. All of these are in the Christian Witchcraft Starter Kit, and I'm now writing Angel Magic for the Christian Witch, as well as, even though uh, Spellcrafting has Angel Magic in it, Angel Magic for the Christian, because I'm big into Angel Magic, I love Angel Magic. Spell, uh, Egyptian Magic for the Christian Witch, because I spent plenty of time in Egypt, as well as um, angel magic for the Christian witch. We got tons more coming for the Christian witch, okay? Then this book, which is my newest baby, ah, that just came out on my birthday in 2023, okay? So I'm a writing fool. Okay, let's continue. Here's what I love about paganism. Paganism does not have doctrine or dogma. You want to be a pagan, be a pagan any kind you want to be, any way you want to be a pagan. If you want to have five gods, have five gods. If you want to make up a ritual, make up a ritual. If you want to get rid of one god and get another god in there, great. People in the ancient world had so many gods, you couldn't throw a stone without touching 20 gods. Every household had gods. You worship the gods in the way you want. You do your prayers, you do your offerings, you pour out this, you pour out that, you burn your candles when candles were invented. So paganism doesn't have rules. That's what churches have. That's the big distinction that we must make in our minds. Paganism is your own spiritual path. Church, you better do this, do this, do this, do this. And if you don't, or else. That didn't work for me. We just didn't. I don't know if it's working for you. If it's working for you, great. Whatever works for you, work it. No judgment on that. It didn't work for me. No, this long list of rules from this God, this is some bullshit. I'm not doing it. Not doing it. And then after you do all the rules, you still might not make it. This is a setup. Could you see that the thing was a setup? But a lot of people still can't see that it's a setup. It's a setup for you to fail. And then they tell you, you're never going to make it. You're always going to be you're born in sin, die in sin, and you're the dust of the earth, and you need to save you. From what? What do you need a savior from? You need a savior because 6,000 years ago, a man and a lady were in a garden and they ate a piece of fruit. And they weren't perfect when God made them, but after they ate that fruit, they turned evil. They had a fall. First of all, that story was written when there were millions of people on the planet. 6,000 years ago, 6, years ago it's, it's documented historically and archaeologically. We got fossils of humans older than 6,000 years. People, stop it. But people want to go with the Bible. Says, we came into existence 6,000 years ago. The insanity. This is insanity. And I believe that generations in the future will call us nuts for believing all this stuff. Okay, let's continue. So now that we've talked about paganism versus religion, you see why witches more opt for paganism because most witches that I know, you're not going to tell them what to do. 
And most witches that I know are not trying to follow a bunch of rules to get to God when we know him directly how to talk to spirits and gods and goddesses and God source itself. So why would we, source itself is inside of every being. So why would we need a hierarchy? Why would we need clergy? Why would we need somebody that's supposed to be a go-between between between us and the divine? Witches don't go for that. Let's get back to Yahweh and his humble beginnings before he got somehow mysteriously, I'm going to tell you how he got promoted to being God of the universe that he's not. Once again, I really apologize if this is really singeing your skin right now, yet it's truth. <clears throat> this god, in addition to war, was also associated with the forge and metallurgy. So you can see what kind of energy this god has. This god is a warrior. This god is bringing the fire, bringing the heat. This is in the Bible because in the Bible, they tell you that Yahweh appeared as a pillar of fire with the Israelites when they were escaping Egypt. That is a nod to the fact that in the ancient world, people thought of Yahweh as a storm, fiery presence, lightning kind of guy. And the forge, you have to use fire to forge in metallurgy to make your weapons and this and that, right? They're in the Bronze Age. Now, Yahweh had parents. Can I ask you something? How you gonna have parents if you're the God of the universe? You can't. If you are the God of the universe, how do you have parents? Yeah, Yahweh has parents. Yahweh is in a pantheon, ancient Canaanite pantheon. Look it up. And, <coughs> pardon me, in some versions of the story, El, because you know these pantheons, they change a little bit here and there, yet there are some constants. And there are some variations in the story. Like when you hear about Isis and Osiris and Horus, depending on what part of Egypt you're in, Upper Egypt or Lower Egypt, you may hear some variants on the Isis, Osiris, Horus story, even though it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same story. But El, who is Yahweh's father, in the original pantheon, pantheon of a whole bunch of gods, El is Yahweh's father. El had 70 sons. It's reputed. That's part of the story, right? His myth, his legend, his lore that he has 70 sons. I don't know if he has 70 sons or not. His wife, the mother of the gods was Asherah because, or Asherah, however you desire to say it, because you can't have sons without a womb. Now the Christians, the way they did this is they morphed Asherah into mother Mary. Same thing. Just like Isis, they stole Asherah and they stole Isis, the divine mother. Also in Africa, she is known in parts of Africa, uh, more like uh, Western Africa, she is known as Mami Wata. In Nigeria, she is known as more like Oshun, not, not Oshun, more like Yemaya, who's the ocean mother, because the ocean mother, all life begins in the ocean. The amniotic fluid is very similar to ocean water in its salinity content. Genesis says it too. What? Genesis says that there's a primordial mother? Yes. Mami Wata is in Genesis. This is why I love the Bible, because if you read it and you know what you're looking for, you're like, oh, 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 I just saw something. And you would have to read it for yourself and you would not have to believe and you would have to not believe the pastor, the preacher, the teacher, the candlestick maker, because you're reading the Bible for yourself. What does it say in Genesis chapter one? It says that the spirit of the living God was moving to and fro upon the what? The waters, the primordial waters were already there. How did the primordial waters get there? It never told you God made the primordial waters. 
What are the primordial waters? That is the Bible's way of saying the divine feminine, the great mother goddess of us all. The waters, where we all came from, from the ocean in the belly. But they want to tell you that God created it, Jehovah, in seven days. Oh, my God, and we believed it. Oh, my God. We believed that the whole universe is, was created in seven days when we have freaking evidence that the universe is something like 20, Earth is something like 20 billion years old. Wow. Why did we believe these things? Because we didn't have a choice. We didn't have the internet. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. We didn't have the internet. We just kind of were like, it sounds crazy, but if that's what they say. So how are you going to be the uncreated God, first principle, source, if you have parents? Then you're not first principle. That means you came from something. Well, we still don't know but how did Yahweh get to be the God of the universe in people's minds? Before we can go to that, we got to go to Baal. Now, we all know Baal. Baal is in the Bible. You know, they came from Jezebel because she was a Baal worshiper. You know, the people that wrote the Bible, they hate Baal. They hate the Canaanites. Elijah is having a contest. We're going to have a contest, our God against your God. Why would you need a contest of your God against another God if your God is God? And everyone knows it. Well, apparently it wasn't. That's why they're up here having fights back and forth. We're going to sacrifice to our God and the fire's going to come. And we're going to, yeah, and then our God is going to be better than your God. And then we're going to kill all of y'all. After Elijah won the battle, they killed 70 priests of Baal. Oh, Jesus. That doesn't sound like a loving God. That sounds like war. Sounds like genocide. Okay. Baal, also one of the 70 sons of El, in some stories. In other stories, Baal is like the father, but Baal just means Lord. That's all Baal means. So whenever you see Lord in the Bible, it's talking about Baal. I know, shocking, right? Lord, every time you see Lord with capital L, they're talking about Baal in the Bible. Baal, also, he had some names. He was known as Rider on the Storm and things like that. Yet, Baal was more of like a father figure. He was more like a benefactor. Um, and the Yahwehs hated him. Who are the Yahwehs? The ones that are this bandit group, not really a huge group of people. They certainly were not the minority, the majority. The majority of people in the ancient world were straight up multi polytheistic, straight up polytheistic. They got a God for everything, just like they still do in India. Like, like they still do many places. Christians are still polytheistic and I'll prove it to you. Let me come off screen share for a second to prove this one to you about Christians and their polytheism. Christians are still polytheistic. And why? Oh, is Mami Wata associated with the Sybils? That is a good question. You know why, Kimball? There is a book written by a woman, a Black woman, who did extensive research. And she said, Mami Wata is the origin of the story of the Sybils. That, of course, was in Roman, Greco, a Roman history. They had 13 sibyls. In some stories, they had 12 sibyls. And the sibyls were prophetesses. And the sibyls, according to this book, the sibyls were the original, were originally African, which that's the case with a lot of things because uh, a lot of these people that are in the Roman, Greco experience, they did not credit Africa for anything because they didn't think anything good could come out of Africa because they felt like Africans were savages. So their own blindness and racial hatred prevented them from seeing that many of the things that they were doing had origins in Africa. It's just the sad truth. And now it's coming to light. And why would every other culture in the world be credited with adding something good to the human race other than Africa? Nothing came out of Africa that was good. And they even said, well, Egypt's not Africa because it's too advanced. It can't be Africans. It's Middle East. 
And if you go into most colleges, it is not African studies where they have Egypt. They have Egypt under Near Eastern studies. They call Egypt the Near East. Anything to not call it Africa, well, if you look at a, cat, a, a map, and if you know your geography, you will see it is in Africa. It's African. So that's another conversation for another day because we just believe a lot of things that are not so. Okay, let me say something about what was I about to say something about? It was something I was, there was a point I was about to make about these Yahwehs, okay? These Yahwehs, who were the Yahwehs? Well, they, we call them the Yahwehs. We don't know if they call themselves the Yahwehs. They were a, um, I would call them a fanatical sect. And what was their deal? That is Yahweh. They want Yahweh. They want Yahweh. They want Yahweh to be the only God. They want Yahweh to be the God. They want Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. It's Yahweh or no way. I hate that that was a pun. Okay. So what do they do? They get the books of the Bible. They start, not only do they start writing books of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the old quote unquote, the Old Testament, they start revising the Old Testament. They do a redaction. And I'm going to give you the references because when I read about this redaction that they did, when I studied this in depth, you mean that they did a redaction of the Bible? Oh my God. Why? Because they want you, like I said, it's an agenda. They want you to believe something. And I can't, the propaganda machine has been going forever and it's still going. Don't they want you to believe something now? Of course they do. That's why your greatest asset is your own mind and to keep free your mind. That's your greatest asset is your mind. Let's continue. All of humanity and civilization started in Africa. Isn't that the truth? But they're savages, okay? <laughs> Look, they got the oldest bones on the planet come from Africa. Lucy, supposedly the first human being, they dug her up in Africa, South Africa. Everyone, everyone knows it. No one disputes it that life came out of Africa. No one disputes that, that that is the home of all of us, black, white, Asian, everyone, everyone. Yet, people believe what they want to believe. And it does not have to be the truth, what people choose to believe. That's the sad part about it. All right, let's go back on screen share so we can find out what is going on with this whole Jezebel thing, these Yahwists, Jeremiah even. Jeremiah was a Yahwist. All these people that are so deep into Yahweh, right? These Yahwists. They hate Baal. Oh, they hate Baal. But you know what's interesting? Baal was eventually syncretized with Yahweh and eventually became the God that the Christians worship right now. How did that happen? Well, here's how Yahweh became God of the universe in people's minds. War. Uh, that's one factor. Many factors. It wasn't just one thing. Like one day everybody woke up and said, hey, how about we make Yahweh the God of the whole universe? And everybody said, okay, vote. Every human being on America, on the whole planet said, yes, there wasn't even an America yet. The whole planet. Yes, we vote for Yahweh as God. It didn't happen that way. These developments take time. They happen over hundreds of times, over hundreds of years. People move around. People have wars. People get taken over by other countries and other dynasties. This is why we said we have to understand history. We have to understand geography. We have to understand dynasties, politics, power players. We must understand all of that to see how religion morphs over time. Nothing is static. It's still not static right now. Why? Because now you have 30,000 denominations of Christian. And before, you had 
not one, because there were many Christianities when Christ died. If you're in the camp to believe he was an actual human being, I do think he was an actual human being, yet I'm open to truth. After he died, there were many groups of Christians, all different kinds of Christians. And over time, what happened? We're going to do that in another Witchy Wednesday conversation. We're going to talk about how the Catholic Church just rawr, came in there and just rawr, rawr, rawr. So we can thank the Catholics. Catholic means universal. In other words, we want you to have one universal thought in your mind, what we tell you to think. That's what Catholic means. The Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire, there's even a book in the Bible called Romans, so it should not be surprising, as we did in our other conversation, that the Romans wrote or co-opted or at least had a hand in the writing of the New Testament. Like, that shouldn't be surprising. Catholic took over, and being Christians stomped out all the other Christians, except that the Gnostics and these group of Christians and these group of Christians took their holy books when they found the Catholics come quick, the Catholics come, oh my goodness, stuff them in jars, stuff them in the sand. Thank God, else we would have never found many of the things we were able to unearth from people that weren't done with the Catholic story. Oh, we got another story because the Catholic people gave you the Bible as you have it right now. They're the ones that came up with it. There were all these books and they were like, oh, they, we can't let the people read this. The masses cannot read those. We only want them to read these. Why? Because we need to craft a story. We need to craft an agenda. We need to craft our creation story. Now, is he God or is he not God? That's what I was going to say. Let me thank you, spirit. This is shocking. I have to tell you this. This is shocking. Let me say this to you. Hi, love, Cho. How you loving? How you loving? Did you know this? I recently found this out. Tell me, family, if you knew about this. While Jewish people and Islamic people can share sacred space, they can use the same sacred space. Christians are not allowed to use the same sacred space as Islamic people and Jewish people. What do I mean by that? Of course, a Christian person can go into a mosque. I've been in several mosques. Of course, a Christian person can go into a synagogue. I've been in tons of synagogues. Well, not tons of synagogues. I've been in synagogues, not tons of them. Not as many mosques. Of course, you can go into a mosque or a synagogue. What I'm talking about, I'm talking about prepared sacred space where they are about to do something that is actually sacred and must be sacred space for their religious practices. Christians can't share that space. Why? Why can Jewish people and Islamic people have the same sacred space when they're about to do something, let's say ritual purity, something that requires ritual purity or consecration? The Jews and Jews and Islamic people can use the same space, but why cannot Christians use it? Because the Jews and Jewish people and Islamic people call Christians idolaters because Christians have three gods. Christians tell you it's one God. No, y'all have three. God is God. Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Make up your mind. Are they all God? They're all God. How are they all going to be God? They're God 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, something like that. I don't know. They can't even explain it to you. It's a mystery. That is so convenient. You can't explain your own story. That's convenient. And then when people ask questions, it's a mystery. That's so convenient. No. And I read a book that says, you're not a Christian if you don't accept the Trinity. And I thought that was fascinating because Jehovah's Witnesses don't accept the Trinity. I'm not here representing Jehovah's Witnesses by any means because they're just as nutty as all the other Christians that believe nutty things in the face of pure science and, and history and archeology. span Yet, you do know a lot of people that believe things that history and archeology span have told you are absolutely not so. Okay, let's continue. 
it's more of the Trinity being reused for Christians to twist, not all Christians. Yes, yes. You know, either you have one God or you don't. And Jewish people are very clear on this. They call Christians pagans because you got multiple gods. And Jewish people are very clear that there is one God. His name is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and the name is too holy to pronounce. At least be clear on what you, you believe in. Christians are unclear because the Trinity makes no sense in any way you slice it. Why? Because it was made up by humans. They made it up. They made the whole thing up. And you know what's very fascinating? You can find the exact origins of when they made it up. They, because they were writing letters back and forth to each other. Some were saying, the bishops, church fathers. These ain't no fathers of mine yet. Yeah, church fathers, right? I believe there is no trinity. I may be wrong. Interesting, love, Cho. Yeah, I'm not with the trinity either because I don't understand it. And I feel like if there's something so simple and so fundamental to your faith that you cannot understand, that you can't explain. It's fundamental to your faith, but you can't explain it. How am, I gonna, how am I supposed to go for it? You can't even explain it. And when you say, when people ask, when pressed on it, the Trinity, how are they all three God? And how are they all three not God? You'll get different answers from different people. And ultimately, if you ask too many questions, they'll say, it's a mystery. Okay. Okay, if that's how you want to play it. Let's continue. But that's not enough for my everlasting soul, I promise you. Not That's not going to do for my everlasting soul, okay? All right, let's continue. So how did Yahweh become God of the universe in people's minds? Now remember, Yahweh, as we said, part of the Canaanite pantheon. Israelites came from Canaan and the Canaanites. These are their distant relatives. And this Yahweh God was part of the pantheon. And in the Bible, it even says it, that El appointed Baal for this group of people, and he appointed Yahweh for Israel. It says it in the Bible. So part of the pantheon, it's, it's like this all over the world, that this temple is for Zeus, and this temple is for Poseidon. And okay, I'll give you a perfect example. When we went to Athens, let me come off screen share to tell you this story. When we went to Athens, we heard a story about Athena and Poseidon. Now, this is Greece, so you know it's Greek mythology. Poseidon and Athena. Now, both Poseidon, who we know is the god of the ocean, right? The sea god. He has the trident. We know his story. And I think all these things are based on something. I really do. I do believe that us seeing the ocean as an entity is helpful for humans because we thrive on our stories. So I don't want to throw out all the stories. I just know it's a story. It's a helpful story for me. I think it's a helpful story. It's teaching you something. It's a metaphor. It's like an allegory, right? Poseidon and Athena, the warrior goddess, right? Athena, super strong. They both wanted to be the patron, the god of Athens. Well, we see who won because it's named for its patron god, its patron deity, Athena. Athena was the goddess of Athens, period. This is her spot. So that was very common in the ancient world that this territory was this god. But you go to that territory over there, it's another god. And everybody was okay with that until they got into some skirmishes or fights. And they were like, no, you're gonna take our God. No, we don't want your God. No, our God's gonna battle your God. You know, When they got into that kind of stuff, it was a problem. It's not a problem. Everybody knew if you go to another town, there's gonna to be another God. Well, Athena and Poseidon, this is the story they told us when we were in Athens at the temple of Athena, they were, petitioning their father, Zeus, because uh, both of them were Zeus's kids. Athena was born out of Zeus's head, right? Uh, I want to be, I want this territory, right? Because gods and goddesses, they want stuff. You know, they want more territory. They want more devotees. They want more energy, you know? I want to, I want this thing over here. 
And Zeus was like, well, we have a contest. And so he said, okay, Poseidon, you give the people of Athens a gift. And Athena, you give the people of Athens a gift. And whoever gives them the most beneficial gift will be the patron of these people because then that will be the person that cares most for the people and can take care of the people. That makes sense. I mean, I like these stories. I think these stories are great. I'm not saying get rid of all our stories. I'm not an atheist and I'm not a mythicist. I'm not any of those. I'm a very spiritual person. I deeply love stories. I, I'm still in the wonder and awe of our stories. I just know it's like a Harry Potter story. Like a lot of stuff in the Bible is like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. Okay, so Poseidon slams his, you know, thrusts his trident on the ground and he makes salt water pour out. Well, salt water is not good. It's not going to help the people. You can't drink salt water. And he is laughing at him like, oh, you're a loser. She says, watch this. And she makes an olive tree grow. And the people get the olives and they can eat the olives. They're delicious. They can squeeze the olives, have the olive oil. The olive oil is good for their skin. Da, da, da. Oh, Athena won this contest, hands down. She's like, well, you know, I am a goddess. And a lot of times goddesses are super smart. Sometimes the goddesses are like way smarter than the gods. And so that's how Athena won Athens. And she's the goddess of Athens. And everywhere you go, no, she's undisputed to this day. Why? Because every time you see an olive, you need to think of Athena. And how many olives do they have in Athens? I mean, olive, olives, olives, olives. Whole, just go to the market. Olives every which away. Think about it. Think about it. All right, let's continue. I'm coming down to the home stretch here. I'm coming down to the home stretch of how this Yahweh person, and I'm, I don't want to be disrespectful. I just want to say, just know who he is. This storm god who was a god of metallurgy and a smithing kind of thing, fire, storm. He was one of the minor gods. How did he get elevated all the way up? So war is one of them because we know that there were two tribes of Israel, the northern ten tribe kingdom of Judah, the southern ten tribe, two tribe, the ten tribe kingdom and the two tribe kingdom. Now, in Jerusalem, in Judah, and there were different kings and whatnot. Some of this, don't take it as actual fact when you read this in the Bible. It's more of a story, once again. We don't even know if David actually existed, yet people are fighting today to this day over David and David's king and one of David's, the Davidic line of kingship and one of David's actual children, right? Forebears, or not forebears, uh, genealogy, one of his actual descendants being a ruler of that land over there. They're still fighting about that. They're still fighting about their gods and goddesses over there. So war is a big one because, of course, the Assyrians came, the Babylonians came, the Persians came. But when the Persians came, they weren't as total in wiping out other kinds of religion as the Babylonians were. The Babylonians are, it's our gods. You drop your gods. You were in Babylon now. It's our gods. So then you get all the stories of Daniel and whatnot. Okay. Well, the Yahweh's, these people like Yahweh, Yahweh is the one, Yahweh, Team Yahweh, right? They probably had like T-shirts or sarongs or whatever they wore in ancient time with a big Y on it. <laughs> this is the Yahweh clan. Now, these people are kind of fringe. These were not even the majority of the people, like I said. Relentless, though. Relentless, going around making trouble for people. Here's Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah goes, he's talking to the women and he's talking to the people saying, it's Yahweh, it's Yahweh, and stop worshiping the queen of heaven. Like in the Bible, they tell you all these stories. And the women are like, shut up, Jeremiah, because when we were worshiping the queen of heaven, we never had none of these problems. And our husband saw us it says it in the Bible, what they were doing. Our husband saw us making cakes with her name on it. Our husband saw us pouring out offerings and drinks for her. 
it tells you what they were, it's right in the Bible, read in Jeremiah chapter 44, read Jeremiah chapter 44 right there. The women and Jeremiah are having a conversation and they tell Jeremiah, kick rocks. And he has to, cause they are not leaving the queen of heaven. Who's the queen of heaven? Asherah, Ishtar, also known as Inanna. That's the queen of heaven. In Africa, she's known as, not Africa, let me change that. In the West African area, like, uh, I believe it's more like around West Africa, let's say if we're going to probably Benin and Togo in that area well as well, going in that area, Mami Wata. But over in Europe, they didn't have Mami Wata, right? And in Egypt, they didn't have Mami Wata, but they still had a divine mother presence. The reforms in ancient Israel after captivity by the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians. So the Israelites, they were just beat up by everybody, right? Not the entire time, because at some point they were they were aggressors. So you know, power changes back and forth, back and forth, back, back and forth. Well, anyway, once they were taken into captivity. They started reflecting and saying, oh, man, why are we in this bad situation again? Right. Why do we keep getting beat up? Why do we keep getting taken over? Well, we know what it is. They didn't say our God sucks. No, they didn't say that. They said we must have done something wrong because we didn't give enough honor and worship and, and we weren't stringent enough for our God. We weren't good enough. That's the story they came up with. Not your God sucks because you keep getting beat up by all these people around you and you calling on this God, but this God has got you in some bad straits. Got you subject to these people, subject to these people. This God sucks. I gotta tell you something. If I had that much trouble in my life, and I've been praying to this God and calling this God and why, wearing the why for this God. I'm firing that God. It's over. Because he's doing nothing for your life. Now I'm going to come off screen share for a second. Because <laughs> I want to promise you something about this. I want to promise you something about this. This is what I want to promise you. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm being truthful. Now, if I was talking about the true creator of the universe, almighty God in this way, that would be being disrespectful and I would never do that. I'm a minister of the almighty God, the real God, the one source that is love, the one spirit that is all, that expresses as many gods, as many gods as you want. Quantum physics is proving that there are infinite intelligences in this grand universe. It's infinite intelligences, infinite. So I'm not saying that Yahweh couldn't be an intelligence somewhere in the universe. I don't know that much. It's above my pay grade. What I do know is that he is not the God of the universe. He is not any God that I love or would care to love. And he's not any God that I would worship. Now, I'm not the only one who came to the conclusion that that Israelite God is evil. I'm not the only one who came to that conclusion. I'll tell you two other groups of people that came to that conclusion. When the Egyptians heard about the Israelite God, they said, well, that sounds like Set. And you know who Set was? Set was the evil one in the Egyptian pantheon. When they met the Israelite God, the Egyptians were scratching their head like, your God kills people. Your God does this. No, because the gods are supposed to be benevolent. Yet we do have one or two rogue ones that bring the chaos and the confusion. But in Egypt, he was called Set. He was the one that killed Osiris. So when they looked at him, they just equated him. Their God is like an evil archon. That's what they came up with. Okay. There you go. And, and Set was the brother of Isis and Osiris, because Isis and Osiris are many ancient stories, their brother and sister and husband and wife, right? So Set was also their brother, and he was, like they said, he, he didn't have any good in mind, right? He was coming from an evil perspective. 
So they figured, oh, he's like that. The Gnostics, can we talk about the Gnostics? The Gnostics of the first century, and you can read their writings. I have the Gnostic Bible. You can get the Gnostic Bible, the more stuff they pulled out the ground to say, oh, wow, maybe the Bible is not 100% true and accurate and historical and literate, literal, and maybe it's not the word of God. No, it's not the word of God. That I know for sure. It's helpful. It's beneficial. It's not the inerrant word of God. No, it's not. Now, the Gnostics said, the exact reverse. The Gnostics said that when the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, story of Adam and Eve, they said that the God that created Adam and Eve was the evil archon and that the serpent was the helper, setting them free, telling them the truth. And I said, that's interesting, Gnostics. Why did they say that? Because why did the God tell them not to eat of the tree of knowledge? This God didn't want them to have knowledge. It says it right there in your Bible. Why wouldn't I eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Don't eat that tree. Because the evil archon God, this is how the Gnostics put it. And I said, well, that, that makes sense to me. It made more sense than the Christian story. The Gnostics said, this evil archon entrapped the divine spark that is the real true God in a human body and put you in a wonderful paradise. And it was nothing but lust and just sex and naked, <laughs> naked man and naked lady <laughs> and eat all the food you want to. And they were kind of like, you know, they were like lost in lust and pleasure and whatnot. He didn't want to make sure they didn't wake up. Don't eat that tree. That'll really tell you the real truth. That inside of you is a divine spark and the divine spark will wake you up out of maybe I need to live for beyond the flesh. That's what the divine spark does. It awakens you to your true nature that you are more than a human, that you no longer consider yourself simply a flesh and blood body, that you no longer consider yourself simply a finite little dot that appeared on the timeline of humanity's uh, timeline that you are an infinite being, that you are an infinite spiritual being. That's what the divine spark wakes up in you. Can somebody tell me in the chat, what are y'all thinking? What's happening for you? What are y'all, What I want to know how this is landing. I want to hear your thoughts. I'm going to be reading these comments with great interest because it's, it's just fascinating. And we've got to have conversation about this family. We've got to have conversation about it. So I am not the only person who came up with the thought or who came to the conclusion that the God of the Bible is an evil archon, the one of the New Old Testament, not the New Testament. Because the one of the New Testament is very loving. The one of the Old Testament, no, he's evil. And now we see why he's evil, because he came, his origins was this storm and and. And think about it. If you're into metallurgy, what is metallurgy for? Well, in the Bronze Age, that's when they started making all the weapons. They learned metallurgy and they started making weapons. So they could go out and conquer people, kill people. That's what this God is about. That's why their religion is a bloodthirsty religion. Christian people have killed more people on the face of the planet than any other group of people. But they want to make you believe that Islamic people did that. That's a lie. Christian people have burned, hung, outright killed, pronounced war on more people. They have cold-bloodedly murdered more people on this planet than any other religion. And yet their religion is about love. Why would you not hold these people accountable? That's horrible. I hold them accountable. That's horrible. I stepped away from that. I have nothing to do with it. I repent of my sins, <laughs> being part of it. And I hold those people absolutely accountable. Three Charmed Fairy. I love that name. This is why I'm an atheist agnostic. I feel you. Three Charmed Fairy. I love that name. Many people are because this has been an evil thing.
Christianity has not been, and my, many people say, oh, it saved me, you know, it got me out of this, it got me out of that. Great. It has some good, though evil far outweighs the good, far outweighs, because the number of murders that they've committed, Roman Catholic Church mercilessly murdering people, mercilessly murdering people for thousands of years, for thousands of years, they held the reins that they were the only way you could get to God. That is despicable. And in the age of information, anyone can look this up and see for yourself, the history of the church is full of blood, full of blood. And they try to tell you God is love, full of blood. That's why I don't believe what they tell me. I just do not. All right, let's conclude. Let's conclude. <clears throat> so how did Yahweh become God of the universe? War, invasions, a radical sect called the Yahwehs were relentless. The reforms in ancient Israel after captivity, they wrote the holy book. The Yahwehs rewrote the Bible while in captivity. Christians adopted the Hebrew Bible whole cloth without examination. Christians just went ahead and picked up that holy book and gave it to us. The story grew until many people on planet Earth were duped into believing that a minor god from an ancient that a minor god from an ancient Canaanite pantheon was god of the universe. It's almost like that meatloaf story. The mother takes out the meatloaf or the roast, not the meatloaf, the roast beef. She cuts this end of the roast beef off. She cuts that end of the roast off. She puts it in the pan. The daughter cuts that end of the roast off, cuts that end of the roast off, puts in the pan, cook it. The granddaughter cuts that end of the roast off, cuts that end of the roast off, puts in the pan. The great granddaughter cuts that end off, cuts that end off. And one day she said, wait a minute, mom, why do we cut this end off and cut this end off? She said, I don't know, ask your grandmother. Grandma, why do we cut this end off and cut this end off? I don't know, ask your great grandmother. Great grandma, why don't we cut this end off? Cut the she said, Oh, because my pan was too small, it couldn't fit. So I just cut the ends off and put it in the pan. But now they have big pans and they were still cutting the ends off. Don't know where things came from, just repeating the cycle, mindlessly, unconsciously repeating the cycle. So somebody says, Hey, wait a minute, how can we believe in Yahweh? Hey, wait a minute, how can we believe the Bible is the word of God? Hey, wait a minute, how can we believe the Trinity? Hey, mate, wait a minute, why do we believe hell? Well, why do we believe the devil when all these things are so easily proven? Just not the case. This is what I want to leave you with. Critical thinking skills and research yield answers, not church. Church is not going to give you answers, family. Church is going to try to keep you in the, those apologetic people. They're going to come and they're going to try to make everything they find in the ground fit the Bible story. They're trying to put round pegs and square holes. Everything they find in the ground. See, this, this proves the Bible. Oh, my God. Don't go to those people for answers because they have the same agenda that the people that wrote the book had. Here are references. It's very simple for people who are watching this and like, I don't believe a word this lady is saying. Well, it's called read a book. When God Had a Wife, Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince, extremely well-researched. It'll tell you the whole story. History's Vanquished Goddess Asherah, Darlene Cosnick. Read Edward Dodge. Edward Dodge will tell you the truth. The history of the goddess from the Ice Age to the Bible. Edward Dodge will tell you all about the goddess. Of course, God had a wife. The Israelites were totally pagan. All of them were pagans. All of them had multiple gods. All of, he'll tell you the whole story from research. Now, here are some more references. Take a screenshot of this. Watch this video over and over again. These are some YouTube channels. You could go to History Valley YouTube channel. I love, love Jacob Berman of History Valley YouTube channel. You could go to Center Place. That's an excellent teaching channel. Billy Carson, of course, from Forbidden Knowledge. He's going to tell you straight up, no chaser, exactly what's going on. Atheologica. I like that. Even though I'm not an atheist, <clears throat> I respect atheists. And here's why I respect atheists. I respect atheists because almost every atheist I've ever met so far, they had a lot of good critical thinking skills. They asked a lot of hard questions. 
And the answers that came from Christianity did not suffice. They didn't add up. They didn't make sense. I find that atheists use a lot of critical thinking skills. I'm not an atheist myself. I like talking to atheists because at least you know you're not going to get the religious spiel. Look up these scholars. Look up M. M. David Litwin. Look up Paula Fredrickson. Look what. Look up Bart Ehrman. I love Bart Ehrman. He has a wonderful podcast. Look up Edward Dodge. These are people who spent their life, they spent decades studying this. They'll tell you. That is it for now. I want to know your thoughts. And I am going to put in the chat just beneath. I just screenshot this. Thanks, Rev. You're a gem. Oh, I'm so glad. Three charmed Mary. I'm so glad. Because you know what I would love to see? I would love to see you are the true guidance. I took screenshots. I love it. I love it. You know what I would love to see? I would love to see a world that is open and free, where everyone gets to worship the divine or not in their own way, where people are not hoodwinked and forced and manipulated into believing things that they don't want to believe or that don't have meaning for them. I want to see a free world. And I will work for that free world. And we together can bring about that free world. I love you, Reverend Valerie Love, ChristianWitches.com. Pick up the books. And I'm going to put a link below. There's our Amazon link below. If you would be so kind as to use our Amazon links, that would be great. That supports the work and mission of Christian Witches in the world because we're on a movement. We're on a movement to help people who have loved Christ consciousness or had some kind of Bible background come into their own power and divinity and make up their own minds about what they're going to do in their life, especially spiritually. Well, peace. Yes.